Heavenly Father, we are here gathered tonight because, Father, the world we know is in such trouble, and we see it all around us every day. And we know, Father, that from what you've told us in your word, that we would have tribulation and that this world would not be our friend and that as we seek to serve you here, we would have opposition and we would have persecution. These are the things that came upon you and we know, Father, that we are not above our master and so we will know them also. And we may have come in today having experienced some of that ourselves. We may have seen it in the past. We may yet see it in the future. And Father, we know in your word tonight as we study about the times that are to come, some of those times are even here now. And Father, we want to be prepared for them. We don't want to be afraid. We don't want to be fearful such that we don't serve you. We don't want to be the kind of person who hides his head or her head in the sand. For Father, you did not reveal these things to us so that we would ignore them, but so that we would know them. So Father, teach us tonight on the things we must know to be ready to serve you in these important days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. Welcome back to our study of Revelation. Let's dive right back in. We are doing an analysis of the seven letters written to the seven churches that comprise chapters two and three of this book. As we go back into this, let me remind you a little bit of the framework that I gave you last week, which establishes how we're going to study these letters. We're using three complementary methods of interpretation that I gave you last week. And all three of these perspectives are necessary if we're really going to understand what the letters to the churches are all about. All right, and the first of these methods is just studying it literally, trying to understand it as it was written in a literal, historical perspective, reading them at face value for what they were meaning in the day to the audience that received them in the day. So we have, in the case of these letters, seven literal churches, communities of believers, that existed in the first century in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. They were experiencing a variety of circumstances. They exhibited a variety of behaviors, and Jesus gave them a variety of instructions, including commendations and critiques and warnings and encouragement. And that's what we want to understand. The second way we want to understand these letters, though, is in a universal and timeless approach, which means we recognize Jesus wrote these letters to the whole church, not just to seven, remembering that the symbolic meaning of the number seven is that it is all of the church, the whole, the complete church, 100% of the church. And so as we read these letters, we're also going to take time along the way to consider how what Jesus said to them would apply even to us now in the church today. That's the second method. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, we want to consider the prophetic quality of each of these letters, the eschatological meaning that's embedded in each of these letters. Jesus selected these particular seven churches and arranged them, that is, he arranged the letters in a certain order so as to represent, so as to lead us to understand that these letters are not just speaking about things of his day or even of things of our day, but are rather representative of the entire history of the church played out over the course of time in seven parts. So these Seven letters have come to represent an age, prophetically. We'll call it the church age. And as such, it represents the period of time that we're still a part of now, divided into seven parts. Those seven parts correspond to the seven letters that we're reading now. And I represented this third view of interpretation using a graphic that you see behind me now. We're going to continue using this graphic as our roadmap as we study through these letters. And in fact, we're going to use it for quite some time. We're still going to be talking about this graphic in a larger context uh, months from now. We're going to start to chart a roadmap through this book by building pieces together that the book itself provides. So you're going to get used to seeing this. And if you're wondering how do we arrive at this conclusion that these letters represent periods of history in the church, well the letters themselves will bear that out. As we study them together you're going to see very clearly looking with hindsight how each of these letters represents periods of the church's history. Beginning with the first letter we studied last week, that was the letter written to Ephesus. And in the letter written to Ephesus, we saw how it represented the first of those periods, that is, the apostolic period of the church. And so with that, we come to understand that the churches themselves, these seven churches, are, as it were, a map of history, like a clock, telling us about what's going to happen. And we're able to see this because today, 2,000 years into this period, 
of the church age, we're looking back in time. We're able to see with hindsight with great clarity. But we also acknowledged last week that before the time had passed, that is, if you had gone back to the first century when these letters were originally written, we would not have been able to see this pattern. We would not have recognized that these letters were prophetic in the way that we see them now. Only in hindsight did scholars come to understand this pattern. That quality, that aspect of these letters, is why they are included in the book of Revelation in the first place. Perhaps that's been something you've wondered. I know many have told me that. Why are these letters sitting here in the book of Revelation? They don't seem to fit with what the book itself is generally about. They seem out of place. Well, here's your answer. Jesus did not give us these letters so as to reveal the history of the church in advance, because I just said there was no way we could see this in advance. It didn't reveal itself that way. On the contrary, he gave us these letters to show us the history of the church after it had already taken place, and in that way they function as a clock of time, but not in the sense of counting up time, in the sense of counting down time. That is, They now tell us how far we have gone in the period of the church and therefore how close we are to the end of that church age. And it will only be that the church that occupies the last part of this period that you'll even notice that this prophetic element is there. But then again, that is the group of Christianity that needs to know this, that needs to know they are at the end. So it's been designed so perfectly by God to reveal itself to only the community that most needs to know it in hindsight without giving away the history of the church in advance to those who had yet to even live it. And then secondly, the prophetic aspect of these letters confirms for us that Jesus truly is in control of his church because he has told us in advance what he was going to see happen to his church and what he was going to do in response to what he saw. He told us all of this 2,000 years ago. And now as we sit here today and we have the benefit of hindsight again and we look at all that he's been doing over the course of 2,000 years to steer his church, we understand how precisely he has been in control the whole time. And friends, if he can steer the church so precisely for 2,000 years of history, then we have the confidence to know he is going to be steering it through everything that is yet to come in this book. So that's one of the aspects of the letters that are important to us. They not only give us a clock that tells us where we are in the plan of God concerning these events, they also give us assurance that he is in control. So the prophetic quality of these letters, of the three ways we can interpret them, the prophetic quality of these letters is arguably the most important one to understand and often the one that's least recognized. It's what makes them part of the book of Revelation. Only those who live at the end of this age need to understand these things, and we are the only ones who can decode them. So let's go into the second letter. We started last week, as I mentioned, with a letter to Ephesus. I'll just remind you of what we learned. In looking at it as an example of the the period of the church, we said that Ephesus represented the apostolic church, the period that starts the church and roughly ends with the end of the the apostles themselves, the end of the first century. Now, if you're wondering tonight how we came to all of that, it, it would tell me that you weren't here last week. And if so, you should go back and and catch up. But tonight we're moving on. We have a lot to do tonight. We're going to cover three of these letters. And let me be honest with you, I could preach on any one of them for the hour that we have. And I don't mean that just because I like to talk. I mean, there's a lot there. And because we are going to go through all three tonight, I'm going to move quick. Not that I don't usually do so anyway, but put on your seatbelt. We're going to move. Let's go. Verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. You will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Well, there you go. That's our second letter. Now, as you remember from last week when we opened up with the letter to Ephesus, we realized how structured these letters are. They have little piece parts, and these parts are similar across all the letters. That helps us break them down, helps us make sense of them. And it always starts with the name. The name of each of these cities has meaning, and the meaning relates to what's said about that church. So in this case, the name of the city, Smyrna, that is a transliteration of a Greek word, Smyrna, and that word just is the word for myrrh. For the spice, myrrh. Myrrh is a natural gum resin. It is 
used typically in the Middle East, uh, historically as a fragrant ointment, makes a nice oil that has a very fragrant odor. But in the time of Christ, it was most commonly associated with burial and death because it was the primary embalming substance for a dead body, myrrh. So today, Smyrna is called Ismir in the nation of Turkey. It's a thriving city. But in Jesus' day, it was just another Roman city in the province, full of pagan temples, most notably a, a temple to the emperor Tiberius. And that made this town the heart of emperor worship in Asia Minor. And as such, it became a place of early persecution for Christians. Roman law at the time prohibited any other religion other than emperor worship. They only made one exception. The only exception was for the Jewish religion because Jews were famous for being stubborn and unable to be controlled or, or forced to do anything they didn't want to do. And so rather than put up with Jewish uh, rebellion at all times, they just gave an exception to the Jews. The Jews could retain their unique form of worship, but everyone else had to worship the emperor. Now, for a time in the first century, the Romans considered Christianity just an offshoot of Judaism. So Christianity enjoyed that same protection, at least for a time. But by the end of the first century, the church had become predominantly Gentile. And as a result, the Romans had come to see the church as distinct from Jewish religion and therefore a threat to the Roman Empire. Furthermore, you had the Jews themselves rejecting Christians and persecuting Christians. So they allied with the Romans against Christianity and persecution became a, nor a normal thing in the church. So Smyrna, it would seem, was on the forefront of this shift toward persecution, a transition from tolerating Christianity to going after and persecuting believers. And among those that were martyred in Smyrna, you might know this man's name, he was one of the early church fathers, Polycarp. Polycarp was, was mur martyred in Smyrna. So looking at the letter, we see Smyrna's record of persecution reflected here in Jesus' words to the church, and he begins right up front with the description of himself. He says, he is the first, the last, the one who was dead and has come to life. What an appropriate aspect of his description to attribute to this particular church. Remember I said that in each of the letters, Jesus takes an element of his description from chapter one and assigns it to each of the seven churches. And the one that he picks for each church is meaningful to what's going on in that church. And here you see the connection, obviously. You have a church destined for persecution and martyrdom, so it only makes sense that Jesus would point out to them that death will not be the end of you. That is to say, Jesus died also, so he knows what it feels like to walk into death, to face physical death, but he says, I also rose again, so I know that death does not have power over you. It did not have power over me, and as one of mine, it will not have power over you either. That is, death is not the end of you. And so he just promises those who believe in him that they will have the same transformation he had, so just as he faced death obediently, he didn't hold back from that, so should Christians know that death should not be an impediment to our obedience. And then from there, Jesus moves to acknowledging that the church is suffering. He says, I know you have tribulation, I know you have poverty. Now the tribulation that they're su suffering through here is probably as a result of Jewish persecution. At this point in history, when this letter was written, there had been Roman persecution, certainly, and it was about to kick off in a big way. But historically, to that point, the end of the first century, the Jews had primarily been the ones bringing suffering to the church. And the poverty there, he mentions here, is probably closely connected to that persecution. Most manual labor trades in Rome were tightly controlled by powerful trade unions. And the way it would work is a membership in a union was a requirement if you wanted to work in your trade in a given region, a given city, for example. And the unions that were formed in Rome under Roman authority would have patron gods, pagan gods that they worshipped as a part of their trade. And if you were in that union and part of that trade, you were expected to engage in ritual, religious sacrifice for that god, eat the meat sacrificed to that idol, do whatever their rituals required. And if you were a Christian who was in that trade and you refused to participate in that pagan worship, then you would usually be set out of the union. And if you weren't in the union, you couldn't work. And if you can't work, that's a recipe for poverty. So poverty in the early church was common as a result of this. And Christ, acknowledging their troubles, blames this, he says, on the Jews, who he says are not really Jews, but were rather instruments of the devil, a synagogue of Satan, he calls them. Now his words give us a clear indication of how he views those who are of Jewish background and yet have not recognized him as Messiah. 
That is to say, they are Jewish by birth, but Jesus says they are Jew in name only. In Romans 2.28, Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So in other words, they may have been born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They may have Jewish roots. That, is, that much is true. But as Jesus said to the Pharisees, they may call Abraham their father, but they're not doing the deeds of Abraham. That is, Abraham believed in the promise of a coming Messiah, sight unseen, I might add. And here these Jews of Jesus' day did not even believe in the Messiah when he stood before him in person. So they didn't do the deeds of Abraham in that respect. So the Lord says, I know these people for who they truly are. That is, they may be Jewish physically, but they're not mine spiritually. And friends, as we said on the weekend sermon, there's only two kinds of people in the world. You're either gods by faith in Christ, or you are of your father, the devil. You are either Christian or you're not. There's no in-between and there's no third choice. And so these Jews who call themselves the people of God by birth, he says, you're a synagogue of Satan. Why? Because every unbeliever is of their father, the devil, until such day as they are born again into the family of God. If you didn't know that, by the way, the Bible says that children of God is a term for the believer, not for humanity. It's, it's kind of vogue to say we're all children of God, but that's an unbiblical statement. We are all children of Adam. We're all children of the devil until such day as we are born again, and then we become part of the family of God by faith. So, as John says in 1 John 2, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Christ, Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. It all comes down to what you believe about Jesus. So Jesus says he knows the true heart of these who persecute them. And I think that was meant as an encouragement in a way because as the church might have been persecuted by Jews, if they knew their Bible, as I'm sure they did, they would have understood how God how he viewed the, the people of God, how he viewed Israel in general. And they might have questioned how God's own people, that is the nation of Israel, could be persecuting those who were following after Messiah. And he says, it's because they don't have me truly in them. So he says, I know that you have this persecution, and I know that you have this poverty. Did you notice what he did not say, though? He didn't say, I'm going to take it away from you. Isn't that interesting? He actually says at one point, they are rich, denying their poverty. But then again, how is that true? He says that their suffering and tribulation is not something he's going to remove because It is earning for them Christ's approval, and as a result of his approval, treasure in heaven. And in that sense, he's saying, you are actually rich. They may be poor on earth. They may be enduring trials. It might end badly in terms of martyrdom. But if they turn it into a good witness, if they put it to work for the sake of Christ's glory, then he says they will be rewarded. And that's based not only on what he's saying here, but also on the scriptures generally. And when the Bible talks about the reward for the believer, that is, the being rich, as he puts it here, it's not about something that you'll find on earth, because the rewards that come to the believer do not come in this life. They are given to us after we resurrect. And that is far preferable, by the way, to receiving it here and now. If you receive it now, it's a very short-lived and rather skimpy reward. What you expect to see on the other side of your resurrection, though, is eternal and weighty, Paul says. So what Christ is reminding this church is, in my own language, he's reminding them, have eyes for eternity. That is, see your life and the circumstances under which you are experiencing it right now from an eternal perspective. What is the eternal perspective? Well, don't get caught up in what you have here or what you're losing here, be that physical things, comfort things, or even your own life. Those who want to save their lives will lose it. That is, you can't have it all, and if you're caught up in what you can obtain here, or in avoiding some unpleasant experience here and now, then you're sacrificing something. And on the other hand, if you endure them, if you turn them to a witness, if you let God use it as ministry, as he will, then you're earning treasure in heaven. Matthew in 5.11 says, reports Jesus' words this way. He says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, 
For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Notice in verse 10, Jesus tells the church how to make the most of these circumstances. In other words, if you want to turn this persecution and poverty into a reward, here's what you ought to do, Smyrna. He says, do not fear the situation. That is, even as they face death for their faith, do not let fear take hold. Fearing death is an impediment to pleasing Christ. Fearing death. I'm not saying you have to embrace it, but having an unnatural overriding fear of death as a Christian gets in the way of obedience and ultimately of a reward. Fear of death causes you to make bad choices, selfish choices, choices that are the opposite of faith. I always like to joke about the fact that how much we put into money and time into trying to look like we're not dying. <laughs> Who are you fooling? That fear is ultimately pointless since, of course, we know that death is coming and it's not a bad thing. Do you realize if someone dies, let's say, sooner than you expected, they cut in line for the kingdom? I assure you, if you can see what they see now, you'd trade places in a heartbeat. I know we don't think of death that way, and I'm not trying to be glib about it. It's certainly a painful experience. I don't care when it happens. But what I am saying is this. A Christian's understanding of death should change your attitude leading into it. Doesn't mean you have to embrace it, but it certainly does mean you should not fear it such that it would become an impediment to doing what Christ asks of you. So in this case, Smyrna, the church could not let fear drive their response to their circumstances, but instead, he says, enter into your suffering with confidence. I find this so fascinating and so contrary to modern preaching. All of what he's saying here, you keep waiting for him to say, I'll stop it, I'll solve it, I won't let it happen. Far be it for me to let anything bad happen to a Christian. That's nonsense, right? Martyrdom is a high honor in the church, and it brings a great reward. Now, martyrdom is not something you seek. It's something that comes to you. But the point is that it is a false teaching to suggest that God's primary concern for the believer now on earth is your happiness. No, it's your holiness. And often what brings greatest holiness is trial, tribulation, suffering, deprivation, things that bring you to the end of yourself, and in that moment you discover who you are in Christ. So they are, in, they are going to endure tribulation, they're going to endure poverty, but the Lord isn't going to remove these things. Instead, he tells them, endure them with your witness intact. Jesus' goal for the church was not their earthly comfort or lengthening their life. His goal was that they would have a good witness in the face of those things, and as such, they would maximize their eternal reward. That was his goal. And he warns them, in advance of what's going to happen. He says, prison awaits, and then after a short time, death is going to come. He didn't pull any punches. Now, Roman prisons in that day were not a place of confinement. That's a relatively modern notion, actually. The Romans had no incentive to house prisoners for long periods of time. After all, why would you want to give free food and clothing to criminals? It's not, it doesn't make sense to the Romans. So they would conduct swift trials, and usually the punishment would follow immediately afterward. Now, if it was a lesser a sentence or a lesser crime, then you'd be fined or scourged or some other torture, and then they let you go. And if it was a serious crime, they just killed you. And that was the end of it. They didn't mess with anything in between. I'm not advocating for this, by the way. I'm just saying it was the Roman way of thinking. And therefore, the deadline of 10 days that Jesus gives them here, this idea that they'll only be in prison a short time, that's very consistent with the Roman justice system. It might have been the time necessary for a verdict to be rendered, for a sentence to be carried out, maybe the time it took for them to be transported to some amphitheater to be fed to the lions. I mean, this is about what the time would have been. But the fact that it's 10, the number 10 has a symbolic meaning in the scriptures, and Jesus is using the number 10 here, I think, to hint at something, to hint at the opportunity for testimony, because the number 10 is the number in the Bible for testimony. And so he's indicating through that number, you're going to have a time of testimony, 10 days. And in that time of testimony, make the most of it. Can you endure something for 10 days to have an eternity of reward? It's not a bad deal. When you think about it, it's not a bad deal. The coming persecution is going to lead to death, but Jesus is telling them, make the most of that. Be blessed as a result of it. Jesus himself promised this in Matthew 5.10 when he said, Blessed are those who have 
who have been persecuted for, persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the key, Jesus says to these uh, believers in Smyrna, is face your trial faithfully. Now, here's where we get a moment of understanding that may not have been something you've heard in the past. It's, sometimes we hear this be faithful comment, and we think of it in the simplest terms. Faith, that is, be someone who has faith in Jesus, as opposed to, perhaps, someone who does not have faith in Jesus. And we move it into a salvitic context before we even think about it. But salvation is not the issue here. Faith in this context doesn't refer to whether you're saved or not. These guys are already saved. These believers are saved. That's why he's talking to them about being faithful, right? Nothing can change their eternal destiny. Paul says in Romans 8, as I'm sure you know, verse 38, he says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, and he goes on and on and on from there. And if you look at the list he gives in Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing's not there. You give me something that you think can separate us from the love of Christ, and I'll go to that list and find the thing that says it can't be. Anything that can happen in your life, life, he says, cannot cut you off from Christ. Anything that can happen in death, death cannot cut you. Anything that can happen because of an angel or a demon or because of some power, or no, they're all on the list. None of those things can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing in your life, nothing in your death. That pretty much covers it. And so the point is, there is nothing here that's going to interrupt their relationship with Christ. That's not on the radar at all. What being faithful in this context means is your behavior, holding to your witness, because, look, we're all people, we're all human beings. If I put you in enough pressure, under enough harm, and your mind is not focused on what the scriptures have to say about your eternal reward, about what's at risk, about what you're dying for, if that's not on the top of your mind, as scripture wants it to be, then I can get you to say anything. I can get you to recant Christ. I can get you to, to uh, uh, pledge your allegiance to some pagan god if it gets you out of immense torture if it keeps your children from being shot in front of you. I mean, that's not uh, something that's hard to understand, right? None of those things mean that you have been severed from Christ. <laughs> if, if you're, look, if your connection to Christ was that tenuous, God help all of us, right? A bad day, and where, where are we then, right? No, what you experienced coming to faith is being born again. Your spirit changed. You, you know, you can't go backward from that. No more than a butterfly can go back into a cocoon. All right? You have become a new creature. There ain't no going back from that. Now the issue is how do you live in that new, newness of life? Paul, or uh, John, through Jesus' words here, says, in the context that's coming, I want you to remain faithful. I want you to consider how this affects your eternal reward. I don't want you to think in short term. I think that's why he said they had 10 days. If they didn't know how long it might last, they might have a harder time holding out in their faithfulness. That was designed to help them understand. 10 days versus eternity, you do the math. If they made the right choices, they would receive an eternal reward. And he says that reward would be the crown of life. Now, naturally, we wonder, what is the crown of life? If you're tempted to conclude that the crown of life means salvation itself, well, the only reason you might even make that assumption is because of the word life there. You might think, oh, that's eternal life. But if you make that assumption... First of all, you're not following the rules of interpretation that we discussed on the very first night of our study. And secondly, as a result of that bad interpretation, you paint yourself into an unbiblical corner that can't be supported by Scripture generally. First of all, the rules of interpretation. The crown here is obviously a symbol. A symbol. It's a symbol. And we, in order to understand the symbol, need to go to how that symbol is used in the Bible. Remember that was the rule? You go look at it in its context. If it's not defined in the context, you go out of the context to the rest of the book. If it's not defined elsewhere in the book, you go backward in the Bible till you find other instances of that same symbol. And I'm not going to go through that process with you here now for the sake of time, but I can assure you that if you do that, what you find is there are numbers of mentions of crowns in the New Testament. And in every single case, the mention of the word crown, Stephanos, in Greek, it's always in reference to a, an award or a reward that you receive because you earn it, because it's earned, okay? A crown is something you get from God for good performance, every time it's mentioned. And the use of the crown symbol, then, in this case, means that it's being associated with something that comes out of good works, that takes it completely out of a salvetic context, because we all know, or should know, that the Bible is consistent from the beginning all the way to the end, that salvation is not of works, but by faith alone. 
So knowing that, we know that he cannot be saying to them, hold the line in your behavior so that you can keep your salvation. That's an unbiblical mindset. Let me give you another verse from Paul's writing. 2 Timothy, Paul talks about this same thing. This is one of those examples I'm, I'm referring to of prior uses of the word crown. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. Speaking about him coming to the end of his own life of service, he says, I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now, there you go. There's the same word again in the same sense. I have kept faith, meaning I have kept my behavior in the right place. I have kept the work up. I've done what he's asked me to do. Kept the faith. Then he says this, and in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me, award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He's referencing a crown, a, a reward for his faithful service, having run the course to the end. So the consistent meaning of this symbol is one of reward for service that precludes us from saying this is about salvation. So Jesus is saying to them, stay with this for 10 days and you have a reward coming. Furthermore, we know the Bible says salvation can never be earned. So then when you say that this is not salvation, this has got to be rewards for works and it comes as a function of service, the next thing you might ask is, well, what good is a crown? I mean, it's pretty, it's nice. I'll, I'll probably wear it when I can, when I have a special occasion, but doesn't doesn't really motivate me that much, Steve. I don't you know. Jewelry's not my thing. Well, crowns are symbolic representations of your eternal reward, not the substance of it. Think of it like this: If you go turn your coat in somewhere, they give you a coat check card, right? That that card is not your coat, but it's the ticket to get your coat. And your reward in heaven, according to Scripture, is not a crown. It will be an inheritance in the land on earth when you return with Christ, and it'll be a role in the government. But those things are not yours at first because you're not on earth at first. To die now is to be absent the body, present with the Lord in heaven. You're up there. You're not down here for a while. While you're up there, how, what does your reward look like up there? A crown. It's a token. It's representative of what you will have when you return. And you know we hear about people casting their crowns before the throne of God as a way of acknowledging him and, and what he gave us. But it's still yours until you come down. I wonder if there'll be like a... a coat check desk at the kingdom entrance and you have to come in and turn your crown in to get your real reward, right? The crown, there's different crowns mentioned in the New Testament. Crown of life is one of them. And the crown of life is the symbolic reward for any who uh, suffer persecution or martyrdom faithfully. How do I know that? Well, James confirms that for us. In James 1.12, he says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. All right, Paul tells us that our performance in serving Christ determines which crown we receive. One last qu quote on this, he says in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize, so run in a way that you may win? Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. I love that analogy about only one person wins. That doesn't mean only one of us win a crown or that I'm competing with you. Do you know who you're competing with? Yourself. Yourself. That is, your fleshly desires for what this world offers is competing with your spiritual appreciation of what Christ wants, and they will always be the opposite. Always. So you're running a race. Run it well to the end, but run in such a way so that you might win. All right, so Smyrna was told this is what they would face. Finally, the letter ends with a promise that those who will overcome will not be hurt by the second death. Now remember we said that each letter ends with an assurance or an encouragement to the believers in that church that tells them that no matter what's going on in that church, no matter what else is said, and no matter whatever future that church might have, nonetheless, he says, you will always be with Christ. I love this footnote, particularly in the case of a church like Smyrna. Let's say there's somebody in that church who gets into the 10 days of persecution, and they just can't hack it. And they recant, or they pledge their love to Caesar, or whatever they have to do. Jesus says, you've overcome, and you will be with me in paradise. Or in this case, as he says it, they will, he says, have this opportunity for salvation. It's not going to be dependent on their behavior. All right? So, 
He says they will be overcomers. 1 John 5, 4 says, whatever is born of God, I love that phrase, that's referring to your salvation. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Not your behavior, your faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? So those who are saved will not be harmed. All right, let's finish this letter with the prophetic content, which is we need to understand how to fill this out now for the church of Smyrna. What is the prophetic value of the letter? Well, we know that Smyrna is the church of persecution or death, and we know that's reflective of the history of the church after the first century. Following the first century, the church entered a period of persecution under Roman opposition. That systematic persecution of the church waxed and waned for about 200 years. And that was the normative experience of the church in the second period of its existence. It begins more or less with Emperor Domitian around AD 96, or I'm rounding up to 100, continued till the fourth century. Interestingly, in those 200 years, there were 10 Roman Caesars who engaged in persecution against the church. So prophetically, it would seem as though the 10 days of waiting might be also an allusion to the 10 periods of Roman persecution. And then the history of the church following the apostolic age just mirrors everything we've learned in this letter. And so it makes perfect sense to see this letter as a continuation of this pattern. So what are the dates? Well, uh, for Smyrna, we're going to start with the other one left off. That's always the rule. So we start at 100. And we go to the next defining moment. What would I pick as my next defining moment? Where would Smyrna end as a period in church history? Well, it only makes sense that you'd look at the next letter and see what's true about that next period and see what's changed and then look in history to see where that change took place. I'll tell you what it is up front so that I can put this slide on the screen and move on. <laughs> 313, a date some of you might know. Let's go find out what that date's about. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit, commit acts of immorality. So you also have some in the same way who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who received it. All right, the name Pergamum comes from two Greek words. Pergos and Gamos. And Pergos means a tower or a citadel and you know, like a powerful fortress of some kind. And Gamos means matrimony, marriage, a sexual union. So the two words together could roughly be translated married to a powerful institution or fortress. Interesting. So Pergamum was a powerful city in its day. It had been for many centuries and it was the seat of authority for the Roman province. The governor of Asia lived in this city, and as governor, he held something called the right of the sword under Roman law. And that meant he had the authority to decide when to apply capital punishment against a criminal. So in a way, he, he could decide who lived and died in criminal matters. They called that the right of the sword. The city was a, a preeminent sor a center of artistic and intellectual power in the region. It had a library there to, that rivaled the one in Alexandria. It was steeped in Hellenistic or Greek culture. It included many pagan temples, as would be common, a lot of monuments and cults to uh, various pagan gods. The city featured an altar to the god Zeus, and Zeus was considered the son of Dionysus, and they also had an Augustan temple uh, that was famous uh, for being the center for that cult's worship. They had a, a school of medicine. Uh, that school of medicine was founded in the 4th century B.C., and it was famous as a place of healing, so it didn't just train doctors, people came there to be healed. The imagery that Christ uses to describe himself to this church, starting out at the beginning here, verse 14, as the one, I'm sorry, verse 12, he's the one with the two-edged sword. Now, two-edged swords is a phrase of that day that had a very specific meaning. It was a, a sword that was used almost exclusively to execute criminals, as in the right of the sword. 
So as such, it became a representation of the, the seat of government. You know, government and its ability to put people to death was a big part of Roman society. And having a two-edged sword was a way of saying, I have the power of government to take your life. Paul says this in Romans 13, 4. He says, government is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. Referring to the power of government to take lives. So when Jesus describes himself to this church in this way, the one with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, it's a way of saying, I'm the one who judges, I'm the one who corrects. And the church, therefore, must be making some serious mistakes because Jesus is basically threatening to bring justice to them. But first, before he gets into that, he acknowledges, all right, you've done some good things also. Verse 13, he says, I know you dwell where Satan's throne is. That's a scary notion, isn't it? This city was dominated, as we said, by pagan worship. So it was in a very evil setting in that regard. But in particular, the city was home to a satanic cult that worshipped a snake, a snake idol. And that snake idol, being a picture of Satan from the Bible, may be what Jesus is referring to here. So spiritually speaking, they're working in a very dark, very challenging place. And yet, in spite of that, he says they're standing firm. They're standing firm in the face of persecution. And then he cites this example of a man named Antipas, his witness. That name means against all. And it could mean that this is a guy who was a witness against the pagan ungodliness of the city, against the Satan worship. And as a result, he was martyred in that city. So in spite, despite his martyrdom, it looks like the church was willing to stand firm in their confession. That's all very good. But that's where the good news ends for this church. Now he goes on to his complaints against them in verse 14. And he says, some of that church were holding to the teaching of Balaam. And he actually mentions Balaam's history here as the one who worked with Balak back in Numbers. Now, I don't think Balaam is a literal character in Pergamum. I don't think there was a man by that name in that day. That's not necessary here. Jesus even makes the point of this being a Balaam like the one of Balak. If you remember the story in Numbers 22, Balaam was a prophet of God. A true believer, if we would say it that way today. And yet... As a believer and a prophet of God, he was also a corrupt and greedy man. And when one of Israel's enemies, a king named Balak, offered this greedy prophet money in order to curse Israel, the prophet agreed to that deal. And then the Lord, as he tries to carry out this plan, the Lord prevents Balaam from speaking the curses that he tried to speak against Israel. Now, in the New Testament, Peter and Jude both refer back to Balaam using a phrase, the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam. They use that phrase to refer to any believer who trades faithfulness to God and his word for money, for the love of money. So anyone who follows after the way of Balaam is someone who places stumbling blocks before the people of God, that is, because of their greedy motives, they will be moved by those greedy motives to teach wrong things to the people of God in an attempt to manipulate the people of God so as to either ingratiate themselves to those people or in some other way convince those people to enrich them. They get enriched by this greedy style of false preaching. So the error of Balaam, the Bible says, is loving money so much that you turn to a form of spiritual prostitution. That's the error of Balaam. In Pergamum, these Balaams, whoever they were, were teaching the church, according to what Jesus says here, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of sexual immorality. Jesus says those teachings were stumbling blocks before his people. And it's really easy to see how that would happen. Because whenever someone tells you it's okay to do something that you'd like to do, you're generally happy to hear that. I mean, that's not usually something you'll argue against very strongly. So when a teacher in a church were to tell you that God thinks it's okay that you engage in sexual immorality or do something else that you shouldn't do, well, we like that. Especially if we respect the person. Oh, they seem to know what they're talking about. I think we can do this, honey. It's fine. We like it so much, in fact, that we will typically move our attention to that person and away from anyone who would tell us otherwise. And the Bible calls that tickling ears. Great analogy. Tickling is something that if I did it to a child, for example, they would laugh. But as soon as I stop, they stop laughing. So in that sense, their laughter is counterfeit joy. In the sense that it's been stimulated from the outside. It's not coming from the inside. So tickling of ears means I've stimulated you from the outside to approximate, to counterfeit the feeling that you should get 
when you're stimulated on the inside spiritually by good teaching. And like a lot of other mindless activities, you know, it's the kind of teaching you forget the minute you walk outside the door. That's if you're lucky. If you're not so lucky, you might actually believe it and live by it. So this tickling of ears always resolves around these same behaviors, three of them that Jesus just gave us. First, a shepherd who cares more about his or her earthly comfort than they do about your eternal future. Number two, a teaching that they give that encourages believers to follow after their lusts, whatever those are, sexual, greed, or otherwise. Do what feels good. God loves it when you do that. And then thirdly, a congregation that is more interested in satisfying their flesh's desires than receiving spiritual blessing in eternity. You get those three combinations together and you got a false movement in the church that grows like wildfire. Notice in verse 14, the Lord says, there are some in the church who hold to this pattern of false teaching. I like that because it's somewhat encouraging. It would suggest that not all have taken over in this false teaching or in this false thinking. Some, he says, are going after Balaam and he adds, some are going after the Nicolaitans. Now remember, we talked about this group a little bit last week in the letter of Ephesus. This is a group of people who were teaching, we believe, that they, the church should begin to observe distinctions between members of the church. And in that way, they wanted to establish orders within the church. Orders of priests, orders of other clergy, creating these separate groups of people who are held in higher regard, seen as having special distinction or special authority. And that's a corrupting, unbiblical view of the body. That's where you get the idea that only some people are priests. When the Bible says all believers are priests, you don't need another one. It's that kind of creeping away from the Bible that ends up getting believers in a place that God doesn't want them. Over time, that teaching, both the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans, distanced the believer from Jesus, corrupting, stumbling them, getting them to think God was behind it so that it was approved. And as the church moves farther and farther from Scripture and into those fleshly practices, eventually Jesus, with his hands on the wheel, is not going to ignore it. And so he steers the church back, as it were. He says in verse 16, church either is going to repent or he's going to come and make war with them, he says, with the word of his mouth, the sword of his mouth. That would suggest, based on what a double-edged sword is used for, that would su suggest cutting off the church. And he's not talking about literally killing individuals per se. He's speaking to the church, much like he did with Ephesus, I'll take your lampstand. To this church, similarly, he's saying, if this doesn't get fixed, I've got a sword here, I'm just going to cut this church off. I'm just going to deal with it a new way. And I think it's even more specific than that, given the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is in the leadership again, the teaching, the influences, the direction, not necessarily with those in it. In fact, he even goes to the point of saying, some of you have been able to manage to find the truth despite all of this. So when he talks about cutting off the church, dealing with them with the sword of his mouth, I believe that's directed at the leadership primarily, cutting off the, the head, cutting off the leadership of the church. Finally, the Lord says to the believers in the church, there is no cause for personal alarm. No matter how corrupted the church gets, no matter what I do in response, you are an overcomer, he says at the end, and that person will receive hidden manna and a white stone with a new name. These are great symbols. They encourage the believer. Because hidden manna was intended to contrast with meat sacrificed to idols, part of the immorality that they're engaged in. So while the church might be convinced by false teachers to chase after their flesh's desire, if the believer in his or her soul knew that that was wrong and withheld, there was manna waiting for them. God had a provision. There was, a, there was something God would provide for them. And then secondly, the white stone. This is one that's particularly interesting given the nature of what was going on in that city. Remember I said there's a school of medicine in Pergamum. And when patients came to that school of medicine to be treated, uh, we know from what we read in, in Greek history of the time that there was a ritual of coming in the front door of this school, of this medical center, and as you came in, you would go into worship and then you re receive whatever the treatment is. And then as you come out the back, you had to exit out the back of this building, as you come out the back, there was a collection of white stones and you would pick one up and you would write your name on it and you'd write what you'd been healed of and then these stones were left as a testimony in a, in a long line. And what's interesting about that is how do you know you've been healed? You just got the treatment two seconds earlier. <laughs> Never mind, we want the next guy walking in to see the long line of stones. Right? That's what, sometimes you see that in some of these mass healing um, things that people do that you, know, you wonder what's really going on in the room. 
It's interesting to me that you never hear the story of those people three or four days later or a week later, right? They're healed in the instant and they're shuffled off quickly and that's the end of the story. Kind of like a white stone written on and dropped on the ground. Jesus says to this church, he says, I'm going to give you a stone. And he says, you're going to write your name on this stone and it's going to be a lasting memorial to your spiritual healing all the way into eternity. Here again, I've got better things for you than they do. I've got better things for you. Don't get wrapped up in what the world's trying to give you. All right, so how does this letter compare to the third period of the church? Well, this church begins, as we know, after the second one, which is the church of persecution. So if this is a church that is different than the church of persecution, we should naturally ask, well, what stopped the persecution so as to allow a new period to start? What, was, what event stopped persecution in the church? And there's a very clear one in history. And it corresponds to A.D. 313. And that's when Emperor Constantine experienced a vision, we're told, on the battlefield. And as a result of his vision, he declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire. And at that moment, persecution stopped in 313. And in that moment, the church was, interestingly, married to a powerful institution, a fortress. Pergamum, married to an institution. And... Persecution stopped at that point, but new problems quickly emerged for the church. Since Constantine ordered the church to be a state religion, what that meant was everyone had to participate in the church at that moment. Every Roman citizen immediately became Christian by order of Caesar. And every child was immediately considered Christian, so infant baptism began in 313. And mass conversions were the order of the day. How many of those forced converts were truly believers in Jesus Christ? We can't know, but we can be certain that many were not. Instantly, what the church did was open its doors to millions of Romans who brought pagan practices, pagan doctrine into that institution. They brought unbiblical ideas like temple priests, statues of idols that you would pray before, infant baptism, as I mentioned, and various other mystical influences. And in those times, those influences of the Roman pagan culture began to crowd out biblical influences. So the church was still there, of course, and the gospel was still available and being preached to some degree, but now that message was competing with pagan voices. Constantine and the rest of the Roman authorities became the Balaams, as it were, by which Satan could now set stumbling blocks before all those believers. And Roman political authority began to infiltrate the church and create really a perfect environment for distinctions in rank to ultimately emerge, the Nicolaitan heresy, in other words. And because every Roman citizen was automatically considered Christian, the institution became largely unbelieving in terms of its constitution. More unbelievers were in the room uh, than not. I mean, if you just did a census of the Roman Empire, technically they were all Christian according to the Roman Empire. How many were truly Christian, though? And although certainly some converted, we assume most did not. So as hundreds of thousands of pagans assembled in the church, what you get out of that is worship of idols, cult practices, and heresy. And Jesus says he's coming with a sword to end it. And end it, he did. Because that church had married the Roman Empire. But Jesus isn't going to end the church, obviously. The church has more history left to go. So what did he end instead? The Roman Empire. That is, Rome, the western side of the Roman Empire, was overrun by German hordes, and the western part of the empire fractured as a result into provincial areas controlled by church leaders. So this was the church of Constantine, chapter, uh, beginning around 313, and going until about 600 AD, which leads us to the end of the Roman Empire. So Jesus brought an end to the institutional uh, government side of the church so as to cut it free from this constant infiltration of pagan influences coming out of Roman society. Actually, he put it into Roman society in its truest form. All right, we have limited time. I'm going to push into the last letter, and you're going to sit here and wait. <laughs> but let's do it. Yeah, you're going to like it. All right, Revelation 2.18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds are of late are greater than at first, but I have this against you. 
that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the, ch all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." All right, this is another city in Asia Minor, Turkey, just as we've seen from the start. Its meaning is the name of the city, Thyatira. Its meaning is a bit of a mystery. There are suggestions out there. One scholar's suggestion is that it's, it means unending sacrifice or perpetual sacrifice. Strong's concordance, though, uh, suggests that it means odor of affliction. And I actually like that one a little more, and I'll tell you why as we get done with this. Anyway, it was the Roman city uh, uh, of its province. Again, it was full of pagan worship. Um, it had a principal deity of Apollo. It was, Apollo was said to be the son of Zeus, by the way. And he was worshipped alongside his father, Apollo. So you had gods who were sons of gods in their way of seeing things. Thyatira had more tra uh, craft and union, trade unions than any other city. Uh, in that region. Uh, and so like Smyrna, you had the same kind of problem there. If you were Christian and you didn't want to participate in the trade union, you had trouble finding work. And during regular guild meetings, they did this meat sacrifice to idol ritual that you had to participate in. You had to eat the meat. You had to engage in an orgy with temple prostitutes afterward. This is considered part of how you got involved in a union. I'm sure it was wildly popular with the union guys, but um, not with the Christians. Looking at the letter, the description of Christ taken from chapter 1 emphasizes eyes of fire, feet glowing like bronze in a furnace. And those symbols have very consistent meaning in Scripture. Again, I don't have time to take you through it, but I can tell you what they mean. Eyes of fire, flaming eyes in the Bible, that means all-seeing, a piercing discernment. Jesus knows it all, literally. Nothing you have is hidden from him, he sees. And feet of glowing bronze represent... Fires of judgment, the testing of metal in fire to know if it's pure. So you put the two together, you got Jesus with perfect discernment about everything and the authority to judge it righteously. And so taken together, what those images would seem to suggest is that you have a not so encouraging way to start the letter for yet another church here. And in fact, you're going to find that the circumstances in this church are closely connected to the prior one. Pergamum and Thyatira are like kissing sisters or whatever you might Kissing cousins? Kissing sisters doesn't sound good. I don't even like kissing cousins, but I certainly don't like the first one. All right. Let's talk about the positive things here first. Verse 19, he says, The church in Thyatira is a church known for its good works and for its love for one another. In fact, this church, it's interesting, it says they have increased in good works over time. They, that would suggest they're getting better organized, more active at the work of the church. More people are being fed. More people are being housed. More people are being taught. More people are receiving good ministry in some form. They work hard. They're pious. They're good at it. And he's certainly a proponent of that. Jesus has asked his church to do good works before men. That's part of our call as Christians. But we also know those good works cannot be divorced from the core mission of the church, which is to share the gospel. So saving souls through the preaching of the gospel, that's ultimately and actually the best measure of a church's obedience. Those other things are just means to that end. And so we preach the good news properly. But if you're going to do that, you have to know what the good news is. You've got to have good doctrine driving that good teaching and, and witnessing. And that's the problem here. You've got a church, it says, has lost sight of that mission. And the degree of critique that follows here is quite extraordinary. This is a negative letter from verse 20 onward, and it's lengthy in its uh, condemnations, lengthier than any other group, save one. Jesus says at the beginning here, this is what I have against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, 
Now, you might know this. The name is probably familiar, but you may not know the history. Jezebel was a Phoenician wife of a king in the northern kingdom of Israel, a king called Ahab. So he married a Phoenician called Jezebel. He, Ahab, was a weak leader. And she was famous for being able to persuade that weak husband and godless man to commit all manner of immorality in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so as a result, her name has become eponymous for any evil-hearted, manipulative woman who leads a weak man to let her do her bidding. I mean, versions of that in one way or another. That's what a Jezebel is supposed to be, okay? Or that's what the term is supposed to mean. And by the way, there's a reason why parents rarely, if ever, consider giving that name to a newborn daughter, right? <laughs> When's the last time you heard someone get the name Jezebel? Although I would say with biblical illiteracy going where it is, sooner or later they're going to start popping up. But now as you hear about a Jezebel in the church, there's a lot of speculation about what's this identity? Who is this woman? But think of it like the Balaam mentioned in Pergamum. That is to understand this woman is a type. There were people in that church acting as Jezebels. And so just as today, by the way, you don't see people called Jezebel, you didn't see it back then either. So no one was actually called Jezebel. He's just using this name to refer to the kind of influence that was taking place. So you have women, apparently, in Thyatira, acting in similar ways, corrupting the church through an ungodly influence. Maybe it's even being used of men, we're not sure. And notice the negative influence of these people is going back to an old favorite. They're being persuaded to do what? Eat meat sacrificed to idols and engage in immoralities associated with that behavior. Clearly this is wrong. Paul had already told the church in the letter he wrote to Corinth 50 years earlier than this, that that's not appropriate behavior. And Christ says, I've given time for this woman to repent. She doesn't want to cease her immoralities. Calling herself a prophetess, which would mean she's walking around telling people, I hear from God, you should listen to me. So like Pergamum, the church in Thyatira has been infiltrated by a false influence that's leading believers astray. But here's the difference. In Pergamum, it was Balaam, a believer motivated by greed, leading people away by false teaching. Here in Thyatira, it's a Jezebel, an unbeliever with an evil heart, seeking to do the enemy's will by leading people into false teaching. So it shows the progression. The church has moved now from having believers who are leading people astray to unbelievers so much in the church that they're now in charge of the teaching, which is the natural outgrowth of centuries of having the church be part of the union of government so that it's now seen generation after generation of unbelievers grow up in the church and actually become leaders in that church because it's just an institution of culture at that point. It didn't depend on a true confession. They were in it when they were born. So the Lord says, I've been waiting for her to repent. She won't do it. So then he says, my piercing judgment will come after a time of trial and testing. Verse 22, he says he's going to throw the false leader on a bed of sickness. And all who followed with her are going to go through a tribulation until they repent. And a result of that bed of sickness is going to be that her children, many of her children, which I think refers to her followers, they're going to die by pestilence. Now, in the day of this letter, you can imagine that something like this probably literally happened in the city of Thyatira. And since this letter was circulated among all the churches, just like all the other seven were, all the other six, that's what Jesus means here when he says, when these things have happened and this illness comes upon the church in Thyatira, people will see this and they will know, I am the one who searches the minds and hearts. It will be evidence to the rest of the church, Jesus is still running his church. And he isn't going to put up with this stuff forever. He knows what's going on down to a person, and he deals with it. All right, now, with that devastating judgment, Jesus now reassures them at the end, and I'm going to cut this a little short for the sake of time, but the pattern is already, I think, fairly well understood here after what we've already done. He says, those who do not hold to this teaching, you can breathe easy. I'm not demanding anything more of you. I'm not going to put any more burdens on you than what you're already suffering under. He says, just stand firm, stay firm in what you believe, and as such, he says, they will have a future that believers can expect of ruling in a future kingdom, of having the rod of ruling that Jesus will share with those who serve with him, and of having the morning star, which is a reference to Jesus himself. You will have me, you'll have rule with me in the kingdom, don't worry. Nothing that has happened to you in that church or nothing I do to that church can stop your eternal future. That final assurance that we love to see at the end. All right. So how do we relate this now to the period of prophetic history that we've talked about? How does this fourth period of the church relate to history? This is one of my favorite ones, which is why I've pushed to kind of finish it for you tonight. One of those that really shows you how powerful this third method of interpretation is, how closely these letters mirror 
what has actually happened in history. This letter corresponds to the period of history in which the church was dominated by the Roman Catholic institution. That institution, the Roman Catholic Church, rose out of the ashes of the Roman Empire itself. Remember we said that the church period that preceded this one, Pergamum, remember that's the period in which the church and the empire were married together. They were one institution for all intents and purposes. But when the Roman Empire began to dissolve around 600 AD, it disintegrated in a series of stages, first the west, then the east, and then over time it's kind of fractured and combined again and fractured again as Daniel said it would. Initially, it split into two halves, east and west, Rome and Constantinople. And, then, and so Rome was the headquarters of the western side of the Roman Empire. Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, was the cap capital for the eastern side of the Roman Empire. Fast forward 1,500 years from then, and you've got what we now have in Europe, in the Middle East, this fracturing of what was left of the Roman Empire. But at its beginnings, when it first started to fall apart, there was a power vacuum. What filled that power vacuum? Well, there was no unifying government at that time who could step in and replace the Roman Empire as a dominant world government. So what did step in? The Roman Catholic Church became the government that linked all of these separate regions together and ruled them all. The church went from being in bed with the powerful government to becoming the powerful government. So during Thyatira, the church is the government for all intents and purposes, for Europe. Popes battled opponents, kings were deposed and crowned, crusades were ordered. This is when the popes were running the show for the most part. The church ruled the world, except it wasn't ruling it spiritually very well. Even still, the works of the church began to expand. That is to say, it ruled politically, and its leaders made whatever compromises it needed to in order to consolidate and increase power. But in the midst of that, that expansion of the church in a formal sense meant that without a government, it took over responsibility for social services. The Roman Catholic Church was the church providing food, housing, care of all kinds for the average citizen in most places within this realm, consistent with what Jesus said he acknowledged about their work. It did have that side to it. But conversion in that time was not a matter of faith. It was a matter of political necessity. Crusades forced people into the church, not out of conviction, but at the point of a sword. And after centuries of unbelievers being forced into the church from birth, now you have the leadership being unbelieving, and so they're teaching deep things of Satan, Jesus says, things that led believers into false practices that practically obscured the gospel from the rank-and-file church. Interesting, during this period of the church history, the Catholic Church introduced many spiritual heresies and immoralities that still persist today. Chief among them, justification by works rather than by faith alone. Worship of idols and images. The celibacy of priests, which is the Nicolaitan heresy again. Confessing sins to an intercessor rather than to Christ himself. Purgatory, indulgences, penance, worship of Mary. All of that came out of this period of the church's history, reflecting what Jesus himself has said was so troubling. So just as the original Jezebel introduced false practices in her day by manipulating a weak leader, well, so did the church do so in this period. You had the Jezebel of Thyatira, the Catholic Church, gaining its authority first by marrying a government, and then when that government got weak, it became the government to manipulate the world. Obviously, Jesus didn't stand for this, and he isn't going to let it stay on forever, although he does say, I give it time to repent. And he gave this period of the church a long time to repent. It was, and, and when you look at how it actually fell apart, how he actually executed judgment, it's going to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Here's what I'm saying. So, as Jesus promised, the Thyatira church, which began in AD 600, at the end of Pergamum, continued for a long time, about a thousand years, as he allowed time for it to repent. It was centered, as I said, in the Eastern Orthodox Church of Constantinople, Constantinople and the Roman Catholic Church of Rome. By the 13th century, almost near the end of this period, the effects of Jezebel had already influenced the entire Christian world and were well established and entrenched in what we now see as the Catholic Church. When Jesus moved to reverse it and to cut it off as he said he would, in the late 13th century, he brought that judgment of terrible pestilence exactly as he said he would. We know it today as the Black Plague. Interestingly, did you know that the Black Plague began in two cities, roughly at the same time? 
I'll give you one guess as to what those two cities were. <laughs> Constantinople and Rome. It first appeared at the dawn of the 14th century in Constantinople, and as a result, 40% of that city died. The stench was everywhere, according to ancient reports, just as the name Thyatira suggests, the odor of affliction. The, di the, the disease spread by cargo ships to Rome, where it then became the center of the outbreak for Western Europe. By the mid-14th century, all Europe was infected, and it killed as much as 60% of Europe's population. And as a result, it severely weakened the Catholic Church in Europe because priests and monks were often those pressed into service caring for the sick, and so they often got sick themselves, and it wiped out the priesthood in Europe at that time in history. It left the church's leadership devastated. And the fear of disease led people to shun mass, going to church, out of fear that they'd catch the disease in the church. So attendance plummeted, and the financial hit the church took brought it almost to the end of itself. One of the lesser known effects of the Black Plague was that it helped give rise to the Reformation. As the church leadership weakened, the church's hold over society and government weakened, and that allowed freer thinking to rise up. Ultimately, it gave Martin Luther the opportunity to challenge authority with the church. And so we mark the end of the time of Thyatira with the fulfillment of Jesus' judgment of pestilence, with the result being the rise of the next period of church history. So we go Thyatira, picking up where Pergamum left off and finishing with the Reformation in 1517. All right, we've gone about 10 minutes over, and I apologize for that, but I hope that was worth it. I want to make sure we do this. Part of my challenge is we've got a lot of teaching to do between now and April, and if I slow down too much, we won't finish. So there you have it. All right, let's go to prayer and then conclude our evening. Dear Father, I thank you, Lord, for patience tonight as we study some deep things. I thank you, Father, for the power of prophecy to reaffirm to us the certainty of your word. Things written long before they happened turned to be true just as you said, Father. And if that's true for things in the past, we know it's also true for things yet to come. And it's in that same confidence we continue our study. Bring us back next week with more of those who would wish to study with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.